Hey everyone, and welcome to the Knowledge Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Daniel, lead mentor at the Knowledge Exchange. We're running in-person courses this year. We have our Sydney course, low back pain um, course next weekend, and tickets are selling fast. So check it out at tkex.org. Brendan and I will be running the show. And to clarify, that's the A team. So apologies, Melbourne, you had the B team with Luke and Gianni last couple of weeks weekends ago memory um, says you're right you were there too only for one section so it was a we'll say a b2 version 2 b.2 how's that sound luke yeah, i'll take it <laughs> uh, today we're gonna with banter discuss a bit of the um how to meld ethics and healthcare and business needs in private practice in the context of, of Australian private healthcare, um, looking at some of the uh, challenges, the realities, the constraints of our system as clinicians looking to apply evidence-based healthcare and um, having an open discussion, um, not promising any answers to, to, to reach out to those who may feel a bit stuck in the system um, that largely incentivizes seeing people more often and, and maybe feeling a little bit burnt out in the process. So there's a ton of nuances and we can have this very open conversation. But to start, I'll get a quick intro from each of you. So Luke, who are you, what you do? Yeah, so obviously Luke, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I love these discussions. I think they progress uh, the, the private healthcare setting greatly so um i'm been working in the health industry for probably 14 or 15 years now i started this clinic i think it's about 13 years ago now under various different names um and we i'm obviously the director and i still actively treat uh, upwards 25 30 hours of clients a week and obviously doing some teaching uh, with the Knowledge Exchange, which um, I get a lot of joy out of staying engaged with the research as well as best I can. Awesome. Thanks, Luke. And Jason Gardner, who are you? What do you do? Uh, yeah, Jace. Uh, thanks for having me along, guys. Always a pleasure to, to chat. Um, I'm yeah, an accredited exercise physiologist. I've been running, uh, I started Your Move Health about 10 years ago. Um, my, I guess, area of expertise is oncology. So a lot of the work that we do uh, is with clients with a cancer diagnosis, but we also see anything and everything else. We work within all the um, compensable systems, uh, have private clients, um, you know, musculoskeletal, cardiopulmonary, neuro, all, all, of, all of the stuff. Um, but we've probably developed a bit of a reputation working with uh, complex cases and challenging clients. So a lot of um, invisible illness or multiple conditions as well. Um, and yeah, a little bit like Luke, still involved in a little bit of uh, teaching and research through Deakin University in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, love, love being involved in these sorts of discussions and in uh, you know, helping others in our industries, whether that's EP, physio, physical therapies, allied health, um, yeah, wrestle with some of these, uh, with these topics and make themselves the best clinicians they can be. Amazing. And both of you are leaders in the field, so I'm keen to, to hear your insights and experiences. Um, looking at our questions to start with, I think it would be helpful to define a few terms. So if we look at ethical or ethical practice in the context of private practice, I can imagine a bit of a, a spectrum here and there's going to be no order, but I'll call you out if you, if no one speaks first. But how would you start defining ethical healthcare practice? Yeah, you can go, Jason. <laughs> no, thanks, mate. This is so hard to do. It is. It's it's really tough. I think um, it's it's somewhat of a, a moving target as well. I, I hear different definitions that I like, and and then that changes. Um, so, look, if you're going to make me talk first, maybe I'll. I'll quote some stuff that you've said in the past and, and make that my answer and, and see how we go. I think um, in trying to be ethical in healthcare, it's, it's about trying to have a deep understanding of 
the range of consequences, both positive and negative, that each of your decisions or actions um, have, both in business or, or with the client. Um, and then being really honest, um, transparent and forthcoming about those decisions or actions. Um, because ultimately what you're trying to do is find the best balance in those decisions and actions that provide the most benefit to your patients or clients, to your staff, to the business, and then also to the community more broadly. And so any decision you make, whether it's as an individual clinician or as a business or business owner, it tugs things in, in all of those different directions. So if, if you make a decision that's um, you know, focused on the patient, it will have knock-on consequences to your staff, to the finances, to the broader community and, and vice versa. So I think ultimately, yeah, being ethical is, is having a good understanding and, and being as transparent with um, all of those consequences as you can be. Yep. So looking at the, our staff or employees, colleagues, looking at our community and considering the implications and of and the consequences of our actions and how it might impact others. Uh, I've come across a few principles and it sounds like it touches on a, a few of beneficence or wanting the best and, and having justice as well. So making sure we're serving communities that need help. And Luke, expanding on that definition, what would you include? Look, it's a massive gray area and it's kind of like when you read research, two people can read the same research and take different takeaways. Um, and, and so I think ethics has a lot to play with what your values are as a person. And that's uh, a, a constant evolution as well. But I think there's some, like, there's some hard, like I think there is some black and right in, in some of this. So one of them would be, you know, the Hippocratic Oath that we take in healthcare, which is first do no harm. Um, and so like, that's the first point of, call at least for me it's like what's the what's the negative consequences that you know insert x decision i'm about to make could have from from a negative perspective in any way um so just having your radar on or your, your glasses on looking for that first and foremost would be a really great place to start i think ethical is this term that's thrown around um from a a marketing sense i think like the commercial world got onto it from the like uh, ethically sourced or you know and it's been tied to being green or sustainable um and i think it's it's being used as a way of selling stuff that that it's ethical and it's better like it's some sort of uh sits up on a higher you, you know like on a pedestal or something I, I don't want it to be like that it's more of a mindset rather than a thing. Like, I don't think you can ever truly be just ethical. Like, I think even the most ethical business would have to, at some point, create some sort of uh, situation where you have to, uh, like, cut your losses on some part of it. You, you, you know, even if it's to the point where you're, you know, planting trees, you know, in a, in a country that's re you know, planting forests and it's all non-for-profit and it's amazing. It's like at some point along that path, there would be transportation using fossil fuels. It's like, you, you'll never truly get there, right? Like it's, I think it's, but it's the effort and the, the thought process that goes into creating a system that's better with less of those negative consequences with, with greater good for all. Um, yeah, and, and not just in the business, in the environment, in the community, in the context of how people live that was really loose, but it's, it's so hard because like you can make a really great ethical decision as, as Jason described it, you tug on all at once. So you make a really great ethical decision for a client and it may not be ethical for your team. It, you know, it may be completely detracting from what you've decided is valuable or the values that you want to uphold for your team. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard and it's, it's a, a constant game of compromise. I think I just add to that really quickly as well, just that, like you said, like you, you're never going to, you know, get the perfect outcome for everyone and everything all at once. But I think if you're willing to be open and honest and transparent about what the pros and cons of each of those things are, then 
that's far better. So I guess I, I'm thinking, for example, if, if you chose to, you know, to set up a business that uh, is in, you know, really high socioeconomic areas, so therefore you can charge much higher fees and, you know, and the finances are a lot easier. If you're open and honest about the fact that that's what you're doing and, and you're aware that there's probably going to be a huge section of the community that, that aren't going to be able to afford to access those services, but that's the gap that you've chosen to, to fill, that doesn't make that unethical. It just means that you're recognising the, you know, the, the pros and cons of what you've decided to do. If you set yourself up in a really low socioeconomic area and have fees that, you know, that are inaccessible to everybody there, then, then that's a lot more challenging. Um, so it's, yeah, I guess just being aware of, of the intended and unintended consequences of any of those decisions that you make. And like you said, looking for, for the pros and the cons and, you know, trying to, trying to minimize the cons, I suppose. Yeah. I think, um, one of the concepts we touched on is like utilitarianism or looking at what might be the best action that helps the most number of people. It's, uh, it's kind of a philosophy of, number of people. What was that? Sorry, Luke. The greatest good for the greatest number of people. Yes, yes. And how that might play into effect when looking at, I guess, having our own philosophical frameworks and, and values for why we do what we do. Um, there's a few other concepts like consequentialism. So the idea that whether an action is good or bad depends purely on its consequences in certain contexts that might be applicable. Uh, so there's there's a lot to uncover here and to say that there's just making a judgment or uh, a call on something being ethical or unethical takes away the nuances and the shades and the uh, all the layers involved in these discussions and i'm curious would, might there be some examples in in private practice where you've had to have these kind of questions and conversations either with yourself or, or with your team about making a decision considering all these implications and, and being honest? Well, every day. Um, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example of where we, we uh, had a hard line that's moved. So, so there was a point going back a couple of years ago, I, I, this is my second or third podcast on this topic, and I think one of the things that I was talking about at the time was how we would bulk bill L, uh, EPCs. And that we also bulk build for the hour because we didn't feel it to be fair, you know, that they would get less time than someone who was private paying. Well, that's something that we don't do anymore. It just financially feasibility. It just didn't work over the, over the term. We had a, so we've got two clinics, one in Port, one uh, Port Melbourne for those not in Victoria and one in Footscray. The Footscray is not a low socioeconomic, but it's not the socioeconomic demographic that you get here in Port. And we started seeing uh, a, a change in GP's behaviour in the Footscray area where we were then getting a heap of EPCs, but we're getting a heap of EPCs with just one session on them that dictates that you write a report. Um, and so uh, at the, I think it was at the time about $52.80 and we were providing an hour and then had a clinician sitting and writing a report back to the GP. Um, it was going well, well beyond what cost to, to provide that service was um, and all of a sudden we had this massive increase in that service because we were doing it we we're the only ones doing it and so then it started to take up so much of the calendar space that we became unprofitable pretty quickly and made start quite a substantial loss and then I found myself making other decisions that I didn't agree with which was not doing the amount of PD that we wanted to do or you know, not paying above market rates and all those types of things. Um, in fact, it got to a point at one point where I had to ask the team to take a pay cut, otherwise people had to go. So, and, and they're things that don't align with my values. And I, I don't know whether it's ethical or not ethical, but it was not in line with the vision, you know, that we had. And so, you know, my ethical compass, whatever you want to call it, led me to this idea that we're servicing all the rich people, all the people who can't afford it, they're not getting our service. So how can I do that? Created a system around that. That system nearly sunk the business, which would have taken us out of, out of it all completely with the inability to help anybody. Um, so that, that's a, an example of where, you know, you, 
you go out to do something and then the actual constraints of the system means that it just doesn't work that way. And it kind of sucks. Like I still want to solve that problem. And so our solution to that in the end was um, essentially we tell everyone that there's a gap and this is, this is how much it's going to cost unless they have a senior citizens, healthcare card, something along those lines. If we tell someone that there's a gap and they go, Oh, okay, well then, you know, I'm not taking that session essentially then we ask is you know is finance is a problem for you and then we make an let the the reception team have a the the autonomy to decide whether they want to give that person their session at, at bulk billing or not um but obviously then uh, we don't move stuff inside out to make it fit they have to fill you know spots in the calendar that were you know the late cancel so we put them on a waiting list and ask them to be flexible from their end because we're doing them the favor by not charging the gaps. Um, so that's the best solution that we could may find that financially worked that still uh, allowed us to to provide services to those people who would just not normally take us up on our on our service offering and service costs. Yeah, so you had to adjust and adapt accordingly to the constraints of the system. Yeah. And Jace, do you have any examples to share? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, as Luke said at the start, it's, you know, it's something that every decision you make in, in business or, or, you know, indeed with each individual client, I think you're, you're constantly, um, you know, you're constantly making these decisions and, and weighing up the pros and cons. Um, I suppose one that, that I've spoken about with, uh, with a few people, um, I guess on this sort of topic is is around the theme of um, having staff employed or, or working as um, you know contractors or, or sole traders within the business. Um, that's something that I know you know different people get really passionate about one way or, or the other, um, and and there's pros and cons to to both. Um, but one of the things that I really valued in in my business was that I didn't want my staff facing their treatment decisions around financial considerations. So I, I as, as much as uh, I don't like this, I, I wanted my job being the business owner to be the one who's thinking about the, the finances or, um, you know, looking after that side of things. And, and the job of my staff was to, you know, provide the best care that, that they know how to do for, for the clients. Um, and so for that reason, they're, um, you know, they're employees of the business, they, they have a set salary, they, you know, aren't paid a percentage or, or any of that sort of thing, um, so that they can just focus on giving good care to their clients. Um, and, you know, I think we, you know, we all like to think that we would do that anyway, but it's, it's really hard when you know that, that your income depends on how busy you are and you're seeing a client and maybe, you know, you know that next Thursday your afternoon is a little bit quieter than you like it to be you, you sort of think you probably don't need to see this client for three weeks but you suggest next Thursday instead just so that you're, you're booking up that calendar um, you know I think we're we're kidding ourselves if we think that that doesn't come into our decision making you know even if we're trying to be you know doing what's best for the client so to just take that that stress away from my clinicians um, that was something I was really keen on but again you know discuss that with each of my staff um, you know when having contract talks to, to make sure that they were okay with that. And, um, you know, the, the things that I valued there was, was similar to what they valued, because I guess the, you know, the flip side is that then potentially does, um, you know, give them security and, and um, you know, certainty in their income, but it also, you know, effectively places a, a ceiling on that. Whereas, you know, those that are working at a percentage or um, as a contractor can, you know, potentially earn more if they flog themselves silly. Um, because, you know, the more you work, the more you earn. So, you know, again, there's, there's those pros and cons, but um, yeah, that's, that's something that I valued in my business and, and made sure that, um, you know, that, that my staff are on the same page or, or are happy to have discussions around that if they're not. Yeah, and you provided that decision, shared decision-making process mm -hmm. and were honest and upfront, authentic mm -hmm. about your, your values and what you stand for and, Make sure that they're in line as well with what that employee wants moving forward so it's also that you're having that conversation um, in the first place and, and i think you're right i think we touched on the the system incentivizes retention to to be fair or seeing people more often um, and 
I guess, what might be some of the, the pros, the cons of those incentives, I guess, from the, the short term compared to the long term? I can definitely see instances where it would definitely be helpful and more in line with someone's goals and, and functional outcomes if they were to be seen for more treatments initially up front. We're not saying that you know, we're looking to discharge people as early as possible and, and that's what ethical healthcare is. But in, in terms of the retention model or the, the system incentivizing more treatments, how can we navigate that? A um, couple of things that you mentioned there. So uh, firstly, like if, if I decide or if I come to the conclusion that I believe that this model to be ethical, it doesn't make something different wrong. Like I think that's what I want to be clear on here. And in relation to what Jason was saying earlier about, you know, um, should people have the right to earn more money? Yes. Right. And, and so like, you consider all of these things when you make a decision, you know, I, for, we're in a bit of an echo chamber here because I made a similar decision where I'd like my team to, you know, have that uh, pressure somewhat removed from them because the other thing is my, my team aren't idiots and we're transparent with everything. So once a month we sit down and we all look at the numbers. Yeah. This is exactly how much revenue the business bought in this month. This is exactly how much the business costs to run this month. Are we above or below the line? I.e., did we make a loss this month or did we make a profit this month? And my assumption is there's probably a lot of businesses out there that made a loss over the last few months. There's been about 19 public holidays. Uh, if, you, if you haven't had all or at least a large proportion of your team take a week off, at least for COVID, that surprises me. And if you haven't had pretty much all of your client base do the exact same thing, that also surprises me. It, you know, if you were running a profit margin of, say, four to eight to 12%, like the, the drop in just uh, opportunity to make money has been that. So, you know, I think if you're breaking even in this environment, you're doing incredibly well. Um, so th that's just an, another little side note there. And I think if you're not in, so you don't have to, in my opinion, and, and how I have come to my decisions, like you can still earn more money and, and speak to your manager, boss, supervisor, whoever about earning more money uh, without it being directly one-to-one -one relationship tied to the amount of people that you see as well. And so like, you know, it comes to this idea of value. Like, so if, if your value is tied to just calendar utilization, that's one way of looking at it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's one way of looking at it. Um, Cause some people may only want to just see clients and go home. And, and so if that's what they want to do, then that's okay. But if value in, in your particular business is to, you know, in our business, it's to, to try and provide optimistic healthcare messages, you know, non nocebic language type stuff. Um, so we have a lot of the team writing blogs, trying to uh, change the narrative on certain conditions. We have the team doing their own social media that sort of summarizes those blogs. And so that creates value. And, you know, do I, pay people less because they're spending more time on blogs than other people because they like writing blogs or they're better at writing blogs. You know, that's not what I wanted. Um, however, you can't have everyone sitting around just doing social media posts and no one's seeing clients. Like it, it, there's got to be some sort of uh, utility. So the way that we've done it in our business is we've calculated our break even, right? So how many sessions do you need to see a week? Each of us as a team, as a collective, how many would we all need to do to hit break even? Right. And so we've worked out, I think I'm pulling back to that meeting. I think it's about 6.75 sessions each, right. In, in an eight hour shift, that's how many we would have to see for us all to be at break even. Okay. So if you could drop under that, am I going to be performance managing you? Probably not, but everyone's just aware of this sort of loose guideline that it, it doesn't work if we're all below that line. Now, some people sit above that line all the time. And some people sit right on it or drop below every now and again, but they're doing other stuff and that's okay. Um, but obviously if the whole business drops, we've got problems because the money runs out pretty quick. Um, yeah. And I think some people bring other types of value. Like there's like financial reward for tenure, you know, and just because you're the longest there, does that mean you get paid more? Not necessarily. Some people bring huge amounts of value for being in a location for a long period of time because of the networks and the connection that they had to community. 
but other people can be there just treading water for a long time and not bring that value. And I think it's on a case by case uh, discussion that you know your, your remuneration should reflect what you're doing. And I think you go can go through points in life like I'm probably not as good a clinician slash contributor to what the biomechanics is doing when I've got a four month old baby at home that's crying and keeping me awake. You know, so should we be paying more or less then? Or look at it the other way. If I'm on a subcontracting arrangement where I'm getting paid by the hour and I'm going through this really tough time at home with babies and stuff, should I be financially punished because I can't perform at that output? So there's just 110 ways to look at it. And so being ethical is not finding the right way. It's the way that it aligns with your values that facilitates this idea of less harm for the community, the client, the team member, all of those things. And, it, and it's a compromise all the time. And I feel like I've segued there massively and didn't answer any of your questions, but it felt good. It's very similar to literally <laughs> all our conversations. No, but, uh, <laughs> some great points that, and Jace, any points to add on the, the front of the, I don't even remember what the question was, to be honest. I was going to ask, yeah, what, what, what were we answering? <laughs> I, I agree with all of, of what Luke said there, but... Uh, in also, terms of retention models and, and in the system incentivizing, seeing people more, how, how do you navigate? Yeah, um, right. Pick, pick some holes through Luke's, Luke's example, feel free. I think, um, see, this is an interesting discussion too, isn't it, about, about retention focus. It's um, this argument so often turns into like how many times should you see a client? But I, I feel like this is a different question. You know, what, what are the pros and cons of retention focus? Doesn't necessarily, like if, if you don't think the focus should be retention, that doesn't mean that you can't see any clients, you know, frequently. It just means that that's not necessarily the focus. Um, so yeah, again, with I suppose what Luke's saying about, you know, just because you perceive something to be ethical doesn't mean that other things are, are unethical. I, I think, you know, the same can be quite true here. I, I personally have some issues with um, if my business was to be focusing on retaining clients, that's, that's not the, the model that I operate on. Um, but I think in terms of pros and cons, you know, there, there are pros and cons of uh, focusing on retention. So, I mean, obviously the, the obvious things are that if you're focusing on retaining clients, then probably you have a fuller calendar, um, which might mean more business income um, and potentially more clinician income if they are paid on you know, percentage or commission. Um, the flow on from that is then there's less effort needed to bring in new referrals to fill up your calendar or, or less time and, and money spent on marketing because uh, you don't have as many spaces to fill. So, you know, there, there are benefits to that. And I suppose that, you know, having a retention focus could also mean a focus on creating healthcare experiences that improve patient satisfaction. And, and I'm all for that. I think if you're creating an environment that the patient sees value from and in, enjoys and, and gains from, then that's brilliant. I, I'd also potentially argue that you could focus on that without necessarily retention being the focus, but but that's still a, you know, a, a pro. Um, and for some patients, there's, you know, there's no doubt that regular contact can provide motivation and accountability and, you know, facilitate more confidence in their abilities and, and perhaps better implementation of, of their treatment plan. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's inappropriate to, to just, you know, shit on retention and say, oh, we shouldn't, shouldn't worry about it at all. You just want to try and discharge everyone as quick as you possibly can. Um, but absolutely, then some of the, the drawbacks, if that's the metric that you're interested in, is that it can absolutely blur the lines between best practice care and, I guess, optimal financial gain. Um, and for sure, this can be really deflating both for clinicians, but also for business owners, um, if it feels like the decisions are retention or financially focused ahead of what is in the patient's best interest. Um, I pause there as well and, and just say, you know, I think often a lot of these discussions do seem like it's, you know, business owners versus clinicians. And, and that's certainly not always the case. I think, you know, that there are a lot of business owners that, you know, the reason they own a business or started a business is to try and make a difference to their patients. So, 
then when they start being you know tugged in the direction of, of finances that's not necessarily something they want or that they find easy and you know that that can cause burnout in you know in bosses in owners in managers just as much as it can in in clinicians um, and you know I suppose for for some clients that that focus on retention can actually get in the way of independence as well so you might actually be teaching patients to rely on the practitioner rather than problem solving for themselves or um, you know or prioritizing the behaviors that that they need for their own health and well-being um, and instead just turning up to an appointment um, so yeah I suppose hopefully there's you know there's a few sides of the coin there pros pros and cons um, but I do also think that it's possible to realize a number of those pros and hopefully avoid a few of those cons without focusing on retention um, you can still focus on some of those benefits and achieve them in a way that's you know that's not making retention the goal per se yeah i love the the start of that where it's more maybe reflecting on the questions that we're asking in the first place and the assumptions within the questions of what is best practice or how many sessions does someone need uh, the why behind it and again we're contextualizing it and the classic it depends is in play right here Luke, did you want to yeah, retention is a triggering word right and i think um for me it's about like our business would not survive without retention let's just be straight up clear a big part of our business model is people coming back right but i'm hoping and the goal and the aim and the focus is people come back because they want to come back not because they feel they need to come back and the want to come back is to achieve some sort of health or fitness goal, not to avoid some sort of physical ailment, injury, rehab, right? So rehab is over as quick as possible. Yeah, injury treatment is over as quick as possible. Like our goal is to get people back to what's most important to them as quickly as possible. However, if they then say somewhere in their, their narrative, normally it's around the initial assessment, when they start talking about the impact that illness is having on them, you know, uh, illness, loose term to describe all mask, you know, ongoing issues, chronic, acute, all the things. Um, they normally say, you know, I can't do X, Y, Z, or I would love to be able to do X, Y, Z. And a lot of our questioning goes to, you know, if you didn't have this, what would you be aiming for to get to those wants and needs? Cool. Okay, so now that you can, comfortably bend your back and that doesn't mean pain-free just comfortably or you have self-efficacy to be able to bend lift twist do the things that you need to do to function um you, you mentioned that you were interested in losing weight running a marathon getting back to swimming i don't know dancing body popping what do you call it daniel but you know whatever it is just so you know we have these services available if you'd like to you know do your stuff here. We're basically just making patients aware that, hey, it's fucking awesome that you've you've had a win. Um, by the way, lots of people choose to just train with us now. So here's how that works. Here's the surface. Here's the price list. And if you want to do it, here's the direct debit form. And you can do one session, two sessions, nine sessions a week, whatever you know your finances allow. There's no lock-in contracts. Um, and a lots of people choose to train with us because they tend to trust people like us um, and that's cool and it's up to them but it, at no point are they or well, the goal is at no point that they should feel they have to yeah and that's a big difference there's, there's a choice there it's not like if they stop training with you their pain's going to come back yeah um and then i think like retention is like retention of that client next time they have pain so like i have the choice to sell this person you know five foam rollers nine therabands seven you know techniques that potentially are going to change the trajectory of that person's health in the short term and leverage a huge amount of cash out of this person now while they have this pain and they're highly motivated to do something or i can you know let that slide do what's required what will give the most bang for buck 
make them aware of our other services, but also make them aware that if they're in trouble again, we're here to help. You know, but more importantly, we're here to help you, your friends, your family, your community as well. Like, so retention of networks or groups of people, retention of trust, I think is probably most important. Um, that, that's what we, we try to focus on. At least I hope that's what my team are doing. And I feel like that's, that is the case. Absolutely. I think Examples. retention, sorry, just one more thing. Like retention is really important, at least I perceive it to be. And from the conversations I have with my team and clinicians in general, it's, I'm exhausted if I get like five initials in a week. Like it's just so much information to take on. If I'm dealing with like five or six new clients on top of what I have, you know, I'm trying to learn their dog's name, their partner's name, how many kids they have, what job they do, you know, what their aggravators, alleviators are, what their goals are, you know, what they've been told in the past, what teaching points that I think are important, you know, what I would like to expose, how did they respond to that, following up with messages, like, it's huge. Like, so if I don't have a steady bunch of healthy people in my calendar that are there having some fun, like, I feel like for me and the team, I feel like if every one of our clients was currently struggling in pain or dealing with some sort of acute health issue it's like everyone you're talking to is there because they have to and it's a very different dynamic compared to people who are there trying to achieve something and, and that's why i didn't work in hospital when i did my placements in hospital everyone was there because they had to be and, and and everyone was there trying to get out of a shit situation and i personally cognitively didn't cope well with that and so i need some people enjoying physical activity and for me the reason I got into exercise physiology and, and health in general is because I wanted people to feel the goodness that exercising and moving did for me and if everyone's got a poor association with exercise that 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 takes away from my energy and so I, I can't deal with too much new stuff at once um, so retention from that aspect is important uh, at least for me and, and it's seemingly a, a pretty consistent feature when I'm talking to, to either team members or other people that when we're doing our mentoring about burnout. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and I think we should also list some or just mention some examples that we have clients who we've seen for a long time as well. I think that there's a kind of misconception or stereotype that we would not have ongoing clients who train with us because they enjoy our company and the, they enjoy their sessions and we've got some fitness goals health goals with them it's got also a, important. i got a client who i've seen for 14 years when she came to me she had a two-year-old bubba she'd just been through a divorce and now that two-year-old bubba is now a strength and conditioning client for basketball like you know like that that family has been in our books that entirety there's been you know 18 months where they haven't been in at all but you know I, I would continue that consider that like almost continued care for 14 years and am i proud of it um i suppose i'm i'm proud of some aspects of it but then there's other aspects where could that person have done this on their own um but i feel like i could justify at any point that you know he's seeing me for basketball at the moment for performance gain you know, and I feel like they would pay any coach for that. I don't think they're seeing me because they're scared they're going to move wrong or, you know, break some sort of rules or if they don't have me that, you know, they're not going to have some sort of, I don't know, benefit. I think they just like the, the outsourcing. They feel comfortable, those types of things. Yep. And if we can create that safe context for them to continue that ongoing training related to their goals. Um, whilst always having in the back of my mind, like that question you just asked, could they have done it by themselves? Having, at least asking that question is important. Um, look, you've been talking for too long, so I'm gonna get Jason to, to start the next one because I'm keen to hear his KPIs or in general, how can we, Jace, track client-centered outcomes in, in terms of a private practice? Yeah, glad that you, you handballed that one for me, Dan, because it's probably the, of all the questions that we're going to chat about, the one that I have the least answers to. Um, yeah, it's, it's not something that I think we do well in my business yet, because 
I'm not sure what, what the answer is. Um, there's lots of stuff that you can track. There's lots of stuff that you can measure. And as heaps of discussions of, uh, that I've listened to, you know, some of those are, are useful. Some of those might not be. They might um, you know, poorly reflect what you're actually trying to, trying to measure. Um, I think the closest that, that we come uh, my practice at the moment is, is do each of our clients have clear um, goals that are mutual between the client and, and the clinician? Um, are they regularly reviewed in terms of like are the goals that we're working towards still your goals? but also are we making progress towards those or, or have they been attained? Um, I think to an extent, client satisfaction is something that's, you know, that's useful to, to track or measure, whether it's sort of formally or, or informally. Um, I don't think client satisfaction is the be all and end all. I think there's, um, you know, you can do a lot that will make a client happy that isn't necessarily useful or helpful or, or good, good value for money. Um, but I do think it's still a useful metric or, or useful information to have. Uh, are your clients satisfied with, uh, you know, various aspects of the care that they received? And then I suppose in, in terms of, you know, maybe, maybe the best thing um, that reflects a lot of what I value for my business is how willing would the client be to refer others to your services that, you know, having been through it themselves or, or how willing are they to spread, uh, you know, good feedback or, or good messages about your businesses and your business and the service that they provide. So that's, that's probably the closest I've got to, to answers there for you. Um, but that's yeah. This is certainly something that I'm always uh, always keen to hear what other people are doing, what the you know the pros and cons of that might be, um, and yeah, how useful it is in terms of actually guiding the way you run your business or, or the way you practice. Yeah. So there's KPIs and then there's performance management, and I think they're two things that uh, often spoke about synonymously. And I don't think they always have to come hand in hand. So, you know, you can have a KPI or a measurement. So it's a key performance indicator and not, you know, dish out warnings to team members over those KPIs, but it can be just something that you measure and reflect upon. Um, I fell into the trap of client satisfaction there a couple of years back, we had all these systems built in to get them to rate this on scale of one to 10. I think it was how happy or how likely they were to refer on. And, you know, would you like to leave us comment why you left that number? And then that was all internal. So the whole team would receive essentially satisfaction scores. Um, and they could see that how they rated against the other clinicians. We could see when someone got bad feedback. Um, and I think, we got so focused on trying to make people happy that potentially it fell backseat to what would make them well. And you can be extremely satisfied and sick and you can be pretty unhappy and improving. Um, so that, that's a, a trap for, for new business owners or clinicians to fall into is always feeling like you have to make people happy all the time. Sometimes hard conversations are, that upset people are probably the best thing that you can do at times. Um, the, the ultimate KPI for a business is just, are you sustainable? You know, so not just profit, not just break even and not just loss. Like is, is this sustainable um, from a financial perspective, but is it sustainable from a, you as the director, as the owner perspective? Um, so sometimes you can run a profitable business and run yourself into the ground. Sometimes you can run an unprofitable business and run yourself into the ground. And I've been in both situations. Um, being profitable and ran into the ground is a lot better because you, you've got resources to help you, um, like financial resources. And it's a lot harder doing the run into the ground bit with no cash as well. That kind of really sucks. Um, but but that said, like we we have KPI. We, so our KPIs are around things that we think facilitate our values. <laughs> 
And, and so that's all really that matters. You know, it, it, like an unwritten KPI is if you're being abusive to a patient, then obviously that's something that I performance manage you on and that would be like written warning type stuff. But if your KPI is, so the whole business's KPI is to, you know, it's got to break even. It just doesn't work unless there's enough money at the end of the month to pay everyone's bills, right? So does that mean our performance manage anyone who's outside of that or do I just have a conversation with them about you know what barriers are facing or how else are they providing value that maybe I'm not aware of or you know something along those lines the other one is like I think as a culture we've become well too focused on trying to make everyone happy you know the staff have to be happy or the team has to be happy and the clients have to be happy and the directors have to be happy and I almost feel like it's almost a bit unattainable, like that if you're not happy, you failed. And I feel like you get guilt that you're doing something wrong then unless it's it's all good. Like, I think it's like, it's still work at the end of the day. I'm not saying that allows you to just run a shit show where everyone hates themselves and it's horrible work and the working conditions suck. But like some days work is just shit. Like it's just, you know, a client upsets you or, you know, you get emotionally uh, drain from seeing someone doing so well and then have a massive setback and go back into old, you know, cognitive patterns that are detrimental to how they're going. And you, you because you care, you kind of like it drains you and it's just a crappy day and you feel exhausted. I think that's just, it's part of it. Like, I mean, I feel like so much narrative is around that, you know, you shouldn't feel like it's hard work and that, you know, you should stand up for what's important to you. And I agree with all those things, but it, sometimes it's just going to be a little bit crap as well. And that not to react to every time you're feeling a little bit low, like you're, you're failing or something's wrong. Um, I think that's just life in general as, as well. The, the other thing is, I think uh, a lot of the, the narrative around clinicians and business owners creates a dichotomy between the two and i think business owners are feeling this ultimate pressure that they can't work in the business you've got to work on the business if you're working in the business you're doing something wrong um i just call bullshit on that straight up and especially for most of the businesses in our industry it's you're not big enough to justify a director's wage and not see clients like there's just not enough profit unless you unless you are in a really high socioeconomic and you are charging through the roof and all of those things. Um, but I feel like if you're in the first five years of business and you've got a team that's less than 20 people, the, the likelihood that you're going to be sitting on a director's wage working on the business is buckley's to none unless you run yourself into the ground or, or I don't know, unless there's a secret I don't know about. But I, I just don't see how that pays out. And I, I see so many people come through in the business mentoring going, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do all this stuff on the side. And it's like, give yourself a break. You're like, you know, I personally, I, I still see 30 hours of clients and I like it that way. Like, I don't want to just sit behind a computer drawing up marketing material. Like, that's not why I got in this industry in the first place. Um, does it mean that the business may do better if I was doing that? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I'd get really depressed and produce really shitty quality work. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm just talking now. So, <laughs> bear with me. Yeah, I, I just... Yeah, in relation to KPIs, I, I think unless you the, the KPI, the performance management bit and, and what's sustainable and what may be in a really important KPI last week may prove to be completely irrelevant the following week in the context. Like I would find it really hard to performance manage anyone on a KPI and calendar utilization over the past six months just based on COVID alone. Like I just don't know how one being on the receiving end, how stressful that would be not having control like that's this idea of trying to sell ice cream on a rainy day like and then being performance managed on that number would bother me however you know setting up kpis around what leads to work uh, i think is probably the better way of doing it i'm not saying it's right or wrong i think that makes the most sense to me you know how many pamphlets did you drop how many social media posts did you do how many gps did you go and visit how many Clients, did you check in on that type of stuff? Uh, seems to be more relevant if you're going to measure anything, if you feel you need to, to measure. Um, I think that's the main one. I'll shut up now, sorry. The, you're right about the dichotomy and I think having 
these open discussions is helpful to understand the, the realities and the questions um, and having that shared decision making amongst your team as well, being transparent and upfront about the realities and the, the, the fact that the, the context shapes our decision making process. And back to the KPIs, I think focusing on the, the client, making sure there's shared goals, as you men mentioned, Jace, and ensuring there's a way to have track referrals for word of mouth to make sure that we're, we're reaching out and helping our communities. Um, and then looking at it all depends on the person's values. And if, if we, if I gently counter your point, Luke, maybe there are some clinicians listening who would prefer to do more of the marketing and that's okay too, just as long as your KPIs reflect that. And also back to the question of, of the implications for these KPIs for the rest of your team. Um, if, if there was a final piece of advice for clinicians, I'm sure you've come across uh, particularly in, in EPs and there's been a few changes in compensable schemes where, where it's changed kind of the landscape of, uh, of salaries, of, of workplace satisfaction, of financial needs as clinicians. For those who are considering opening up a clinic or um, starting to, to see clients as a sole trader, thinking what would be some of the realities involved in that, as well as some pieces of advice? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Dan. Um, I think, so some of my answers to this probably depend a little bit on like the style or the scale that you're talking about. So, so some of this information is probably different if you're planning on being a, a sole trader, um, you know, just you and, and that sort of thing versus if you're you know, physically looking to, to have a clinical space and take on staff and that sort of thing. But, but then probably some of the bits and pieces of advice would be, would be pretty similar. Um, I think the first, I'm going to come back to something Luke said earlier uh, about, you know, any decision that you make, you know, one of the important things is to first of all, think about the negative consequences or, or you know, the drawbacks. Um, I think the same is true just for pulling the trigger for starting your own business. Know what you're getting into. It's, um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. You'll spend a huge amount of time having to do things that may not necessarily be what you're trained in or, or enjoy doing. Um, as Luke was saying before, it's hard. Um, and especially if you do, um, you know, rent a clinical space or employ staff, you take on a lot of extra responsibility, both financial and, and otherwise. Um, and essentially as the owner of the business, you shoulder that risk. Um, I think a lot of conversations I've had with people and, and that I've had in the past about starting a business is you're drawn to the idea of um, being able to work your own hours and, you know, and earn plenty of money. Um, and at least in healthcare, this is sort of rarely the case. It often means working a lot more hours, um, possibly for less money. Um, and even when you're not working, and, and this is probably the key one to me, even when you're not working, you're still thinking about the business. So as a business owner compared to an employee, you can't really turn work off um, like you can when you work for somebody else. That being said, I don't want this to all be you know, negative and you know, don't start a business. I just think it's important to be aware of some of those things if, if you are going to take that step. Um, but if you think that it is for you, then I'd suggest being really clear on what your business is designed to achieve. So what, what is the, the purpose? Um, be really clear on what your values are and then what your business's values are and refer back to those regularly, frequently, all the time. Um, find yourself uh, a business mentor or, or you know, teammates that you can chat with um, and ask for help often, all the time. Um, and I think being willing to critique or to have critiqued every decision that you make um, and being ready to change your mind often without letting your emotion get in the way of that too much. And that's possibly one of the hardest things to do as a business owner. You, you know, it's, it's your baby. It's something you've created. It's, you know, something hopefully that you're really proud of. Um, and it can be really easy, you know, when something isn't going well to not want to let go of an idea or a, 
a, a decision or a value that you had and you know not let go of a sinking ship um, even though you really should um, yeah I suppose there's there's a bunch of thoughts I don't know how coherent that was but um, yeah they'd be some of the the initial things that I would suggest if you're contemplating going out on your own or starting your own thing um, my, my initial response to that would be don't do it but um <laughs> No, look, the, the, the highs are super high when things are going well. The lows, the, the lows are super low when they're going bad. Um, I think if you are uncomfortable with unknowns, then then don't would, would be my first thing. Like if, if not knowing what the future holds bothers you or gives you anxiety, don't open a business um, because there are so many unknowns. You constantly, you just have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. If you struggle trying to switch off, then my my honest advice would be don't because it is so much harder to switch off from your own business than it is from a job. And I know that everyone's reachable via email now and everyone's just a phone call, a text, a social media post, a bump, a tag, a hashtag away. But um, it's, yeah, it's inherently hard to, when you know you're shouldering all those risks to just walk away and have a holiday or to even just sit for an hour when there's always something to be done, when there's always something to follow up on, and there's always something to check, there's always something to improve. Um, it, it, that is a, a skill in itself, and I don't think I've even mastered it yet. And when you talk to most um, really successful business owners, you can see it in their personality type. They are just go people all the time. Um, and, you know, you, you'll hear about successful business people talking about how you know they meditate and they do all these things but they tend to do that after they've got there um most of the first five years of business is running around thinking what in the fucking hell do i do next um why did i do this and you know all of those types of thoughts um however the the, the dividends if, if it does work it, it can go really well you, you can make quite a lot of money um the biggest thing for me the the reason why i don't regret doing what I do is I know I need huge amounts of autonomy. If, if I feel like I'm trapped in a system that I can't change, I am so disengaged that quickly. Um, so for me, owning a business is about the ability to make choice, even if that choice is hard. And even if that choice is means a lot of work for me and a lot of financial sacrifice and time sacrifice and worry at night and all of those things. Um, but I need that autonomy. And I also like the ability, or I like the idea that I can create autonomy within the team. So just quick little segue, I just had a, a team catch up with one of my team members and they basically just said, hey, I've just started doing all of these jobs because I sort of, you know, it just needed to be done. I um, just wanted to check in that, is that okay? Can I do that work? And two, I just want to know how much time I'm allowed to allocate to that type of work in relation to the other requirements. And I was like, if you like the work and it's not going to stress you out, by all means, have at it. Um, and this particular work, here's some warning signs. Here, that particular type of work can make you feel like this. And if that's the case, just let me know. We'll take it off your hands. Um, and also, I'm not sure how much time you want to spend doing that work. So you just let me know and we'll, we'll do our best to, to make that work. Um, while you're at it, if you are doing that work, if you wouldn't mind systemizing it, so if you do take a holiday, when we have to pick it up, um, that we know what we're doing. That's how the meeting went. Um, I tried to leave out as much identifying details as possible there. Um, so if I had a, a really strict job description with strict KPIs, that person probably wouldn't have picked up that work because it wouldn't have been beneficial for them. It wouldn't have moved them towards anything. Um, so that's why I like autonomy. So if autonomy is big for you, um, maybe a business or your own business or that type of stuff is good. So reflecting on our values and if we are stuck in a system that is probably not in line with our values or, or just uh, moving us away from the kind of clinical work that we want to do or having that impact that we feel we, we could have, it's always an option to reach out for help, to seek mentors, to, to, to know the realities as well. I think that's helpful. Um, so far, both of your honesty and like your response have been very honest, authentic, and it's quite refreshing to hear this uh, from, from clinic owners. 
and, and maybe we can have these conversations more often. I think that would be helpful for, for both clinicians looking to maybe develop their business in the future and, and also employees within a business. It's helpful for, for all of us to understand the intricacies and these questions that we ask ourselves. I know that there were a few other questions. So final words from each gentleman, any, any bits that we may have missed or? Yeah, I think if you're a clinician, try and appreciate um, that your boss, clinic owner, manager, whatever, they don't really know what they're doing. Like they, they know the general construct and the rules and how to adhere to their role and whatnot, but they are literally, it's, it's kind of like when you, you, you're first out of uni, like you know your anatomy, you know all this stuff and you're, you've got this patient sitting in front of you in pain and you're trying to make sense of it. And you, you're never really truly 100% sure. Sometimes you get some good results by doing X and sometimes you get a bit of a flare up if you do Y. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're doing something right or wrong. It just is. And it's kind of a bit like business that you've got this thing in front of you and you know that if you pull this lever over here, it goes well, but there's this other consequence that is a result of pulling this lever. And they're sitting there at this control desk knowing that every lever that they pull, you know, has a huge amount of consequences and they're trying to deal with this and they do want you to be happy most of the time. And so if you're a clinician feeling stuck by a particular KPI or value clash, just have a chat to them about how you feel, but also what do they need? What's stressing them out? And you may be able to come to a nice conclusion where you get the type of work that you want that satisfies all of their needs um, without you being measured on X KPI or you know, doing whatever. The other thing is like working in that really free relationship with your manager, boss, clinic owner, whatever, which I try to create at my clinics is, is also really stressful as in, because my team know, so if, if I have someone come to me and say, look, I really want to just work less into the evening. I want to work more day shifts. I don't want to do, you know, after five o'clock on a, on a Thursday night, I'll be like, okay, well, you know, you have the conversation with your clients and like make it work. But they know full well that if they, they're closing down after hours work, that they're like, my team would know that they're limiting certain people who can't make it during business hours because they have responsibilities. My, my team know that it's easy to fill your calendar outside of those hours. So if they are worried about how full their calendar is, my team know that if they're a new clinician, that they don't have a network and it's probably going to be harder to fill mid, midday hours. That's okay. Just, they just know the consequences. So rather than it being really rigid, I'm just going to tell you what you're going to do. And this is the constraints it worked in. My team can do almost whatever they want, but then they have to wear the consequences. So there's like this push of responsibility down the chain, but like I don't, I try and create a flat culture in our business. And that would be stressful. You know, I, I'd be transparent in everything that we do. So every month, everyone sees the figures, everyone sees everything. But that means everyone sees everything. So they're almost across the exact same amount of information that I'm across. So if the business has made a loss of $20,000 for the month, they know it, they feel it. You know what I mean? So although I don't pay them on a performance structure, they sort of, it's like seeing the scoreboard being down at half time. You know, like, and, and the thing is when the scoreboard's down, like it, it's not as fun, right? It, it's stressful when you're down at half time. Whereas when you're up at halftime, you're in there, you know, slapping each other on the back, squirting each other with the water bottle. Halftime when you're down, coach is about to yell. Well, the coach doesn't even need to yell. Yeah, so it's kind of like that, that idea of everything has a payoff. Oh yeah, I get to do whatever I want at work and I can just tell my boss and you know, that's sick. But there's a consequence. It means you wear probably a lot of responsibility when you make those decisions. So, you know, just because you have KPIs and maybe your, your work structure is rigid doesn't mean it's bad. You may hate the other. Yeah, so I suppose careful what you wish for. I don't know. Yeah, I reckon, um, you know, the, the, the way forward with so much of this is, is to have open and honest conversations. Um, you know, there's, I guess I'm trying to sum up a few other bits and pieces that we've spoken about. There's, like there's always going to be aspects of work that we don't like. Um, and hopefully there's going to be a lot of aspects of, of work that you do like. Um, I think if we give up or run at 
the first sign of something we don't like, that's probably not overly helpful. And I think it's pretty unrealistic. Like Luke was saying before, you, like the pursuit of being happy all day, every day is just unrealistic, whether it's at work or, or life in general. Being unhappy is, is a reality. It doesn't mean it's nice, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a reality. There's gonna be some things at work that that are hard or that you disagree with or, or that you don't like i mean we'd all most of us would like to be probably paid more than we are do less that we are have you know less consequences for things when they go wrong but you know something something's got to give somewhere so um I, I think the way forward for so many of those things that that aren't exactly the way you like them is having the capacity to talk about them and so i think for me the real red flag for a workplace is if you can't talk about them that's that's the sort of thing that for me personally, I, I would be looking at getting out of. Um, if, if there's things that you're not happy with, but you feel that you have a relationship with your supervisor, manager, boss, coworkers, um, where you can have open and honest dialogue about that and try and uh, come up with a solution or, or as Luke was saying, maybe um, you know, gain a greater understanding of you know, why that's the case, that if we change this, then you know, the consequence you want is here, but then also the other consequences are A, B, C, D, and you know we we actually don't feel that that, that can work. Um, your how, how strongly you're hanging on to, to that gripe might actually change, you know, with with more understanding and more communication about that. So um, even in terms of the question before Daniel about you know if, if people are kind of disenchanted or dis disillusioned with their workplace and are thinking about going out on their own, um, I think absolutely having a frank conversation uh, with the workplace first off is is a really important intermediate step if if there's then you know no dialogue or, or no capacity for for anything to be changed or collaborated on then okay maybe maybe leaving is an option um but yeah i think just just bailing out because something's not exactly the way you want it is is really unhelpful and um uh, I guess, you know, I'll speak from, from my perspective as a business, business owner, and I'm, I'm sure it's similar to Luke, is like that's really unhelpful both ways. Like that's so destabilizing to a small business when, um, you know, when somebody leaves without any warning or, um, you know, with, without me having been given any opportunity to, you know, to try and help or to try and, you know, alter things or, or change things. Um, that's really, really tough. Um, and, you know, for me as somebody who, um, you know, genuinely cares for my staff, like I, I take that as a, would take that as a personal knock, as well as the, you know, the challenge that it poses to the business in terms of then, you know, advertising a position, interviewing, hiring, training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I genuinely think realistically for, you know, for any of those sorts of things, um, the, the first step and, and the, you know, the best option for everyone is, is always to be able to have a, an open and honest conversation and, and, you know, try and see what the best outcome is going to be for everybody. Um, and then if for whatever reason, there's not a satisfactory outcome or, or there's not satisfactory communication, well then, yeah, for sure, maybe, um, you know, more drastic measures are, are needed then, whether it's a louder conversation or, or whether it's, you know, cutting ties and, and moving on, then, yeah, that, that might be the case. But yeah, I'm always a huge advocate for, for having a chat first. There, there shouldn't be anything that you don't feel like you can talk to your, your employer or your supervisor about. Yeah, just really quickly, don't threaten them with leaving for everything that you want. But if, if you're at the point of leaving, you need to probably let them know as well. Um, because sometimes you get a request to change something and you're like, oh yeah, yep, I'll make that work when I can. And because you're juggling a hundred other things and that may be the thing that people are sitting on the fence over and you're unaware and then it happens and you just like, if I, if I had known it was that serious, I, I, it would have jumped up my priority list. But as, as an owner, you, you're in the business of putting out the, the biggest fire at any point in time. There's always a fire, always. Um, so if you're not feeling hurt, it's not because they most likely don't care about you. It's because there was some other fire that they perceived to be more dangerous at the time. And so don't take it personally if you're feeling like you're being unheard. But if you've gone back and said, look, I'm, at, I'm considering looking elsewhere. I'm, I'm thinking about moving on because this is really you know, not working for me and then you're not heard, well, then obviously you've made the right choice. But I would find it odd for a business owner not to act on that unless, uh, 
the constraints were so strong that they couldn't act on it, um, in which case it sucks for the business owner and um, it sucks for you probably too because you'd probably like to stay. But, yeah, my Mac's about to go flat, so uh, good time to end this, I reckon. <laughs> I've had enough of you and so all, have, have all the listeners, Luke. But finally, uh, we'll just get if people want to reach out for more information or if they want to contact each of you. Luke, we'll get you first for yep, any Luke listeners. at pkex.org or luke at thebiomechanics.com.au. Both those emails come to me. Happy to chat anytime. Awesome. And Jace? Uh, always happy to chat through. Uh, you can hit me up on Facebook or you can email me at jason.gardner at yourmovehelps.com.au. Amazing. Gents, it's been a very deep, meaningful discussion. I really appreciate your responses and... I think this is part one of many to come. God. <laughs> um, and until the next time, very much appreciate your time and insights. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, guys.